Good afternoon. Um, first, I want to let everybody know that following this briefing uh, in the studio here, we will have available for your questions uh, officials from several foreign organizations involved in demining efforts in Afghanistan, Angola, Bosnia, and Cambodia. Uh, they have been attending the International Mine Action Center workshop sponsored by DOD's Assistant Secretary uh, for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict, uh, which was held at uh, Fort Belvoir this week. Um, and uh, as I say, that will follow this briefing. Um, also, I want to uh, take just a minute here to go over a few of the uh, highlights of uh, the S-4 action that occurred this morning um, and tell you a little bit about it uh, before I take questions. I think most of you know that uh, NATO Secretary General Solana uh, made an announcement this morning that uh, S-4 had uh, detained um, a previously indicted war criminal. Uh, what I can tell you more about that situation was that um, uh, early this morning in the uh, town of um, Bialina, uh, in this uh, S-4 action, uh, uh, U.S. troops uh, detained an individual by the name of uh, Goran Yelisic. Uh, he is a Bosnian Serb. Uh, who is uh, wanted by the International uh, War Crimes Tribunal for a variety of crimes. Uh, he is one of only seven individuals um, out of 20 open indictments uh, charged with uh, genocide. And his crimes include murder, uh, crimes against humanity, torture, uh, plunder, and cruel treatment. He was, uh, in the uh, 1992 time frame, the uh, commander of uh, the Luca prison uh, camp, which was near Birchko. Um, and it is in connection with his uh, assignment there that he uh, uh, conducted himself in a way that, uh, uh, that led to these indictments. Um, he is quoted in... Uh, in a recent interview that he conducted with a, uh, a Dutch newspaper as calling himself the Serb Adolf. Um, and uh, he had, uh, in various other situations, challenged the international community to bring him to justice. That occurred today. Uh, although he was armed, uh, my understanding is that no shots were fired. Uh, no one was injured save uh, uh, Yelisic, uh, and he sustained a bruise uh, to his face. Uh, he has uh, uh, now arrived in The Hague, having been transported there uh, via a 130 aircraft. Um, the, he was escorted there by a variety of, uh, of representatives from a number of, of, of nations. Uh, right after the detention action. Uh, he was uh, transported to uh, a helicopter landing site, put on a helicopter, and taken by helicopter uh, from uh, Bialina to uh, the Tuzla area, where the process of turning him over to the international war crimes authorities uh, was carried out. And subsequently, uh, as I say, he was put on the 130. Uh, earlier today, uh, Secretary of Defense Cohen, who uh, made a brief stop at Elmendorf Air Force Base en route back here to Washington uh, from his uh, Far East trip, uh, uh, commented on the case and indicated that it sends a clear message that those individuals who, um, who have been uh, indicted by the uh, War Crimes Tribunal um, should understand that eventually they will be apprehended. Uh, they should turn themselves over. They belong in The Hague, where uh, authorities there can determine uh, the 
um, appropriate actions that should be taken uh, in connection with uh, these indictments. Now, with that little rundown, I'd be glad to try and answer any questions that I can on this. My, yeah, uh, Tammy. How many U.S. troops were involved in the action? Can you give us any breakdown of the types of assets that were used? And what units? Uh, actually, um, I'm not in a position to do that. I, uh, I think that uh, everyone should understand that, um, um, as we have done in the past, uh, these um, these detention um, actions involve a variety of uh, S-4 uh, units. I will tell you that, um, that we certainly uh, want to make sure that our own troops, uh, and I know this is true of other nations, are adequately uh, trained and equipped to carry out whatever missions they're assigned and that certainly is uh, true in, um, in this kind of uh, operation. Um, I can tell you that Americans, this occurred, of course, in uh, the uh, multinational division north area, which is the sector that is uh, uh, led by um, U.S. general. And uh, it, was, it involved uh, extensive U.S. Um, uh, troops. Um, but I'm not going to get into uh, specific numbers or what units they came from. Mike, the uh, rules of the road over there, as stated from this podium many times, are that uh, if S-4 forces run into these people, they may or may not apprehend them. So can we assume that they just ran into this guy driving down the road? What we can assume in this one is that they uh, certainly uh, – observed uh, this individual. He was uh, apprehended outside um, uh, his uh, apartment, as I understand it. Uh, they observed him. Uh, the situation uh, was such that they um, uh, could uh, detain him and turn him over to authorities in a way that the operational commanders, including uh, General uh, Clark, who is the uh, overall NATO commander, and General Shen Seki, who is the operational commander there in Bosnia, felt uh, that uh, this was an appropriate action to take and could be taken uh, without any uh, undue uh, risk to the troops involved. And I think that the results speak for themselves on that score. Yeah, Mark. Did this apprehension require any special deployment order or uh, from, from outside of the uh, the NATO chain of command or any special approval from Washington to, well, to go ahead? I, th I think uh, that uh, uh, Mike McCurry spoke on this this morning and indicated that the president had approved this, uh, uh, this uh, action that was uh, taken by U.S. troops. But that's not unusual because I think you know that uh, any kind of activity that is un un undertaken by NATO and involves uh, U.S. troops uh, – is um, is uh, briefed to uh, the president, and he approves our um, our involvement in those activities. And this was no exception. What about deployment order aspect? Deployment. Any, any additional assets had to be deployed to the theater in order to uh, to carry out this mission? Uh, all I can tell you about that is, as I mentioned before, that we wanted to uh, to make sure, as we do in any operation, that we have the appropriate uh, uh, people. Uh, assigned S-4 who can carry out an operation. Um, that's been the case since the day we got there, and it will remain so until we leave. Can yeah. you help us understand your reluctance to even talk about which units were involved? Excuse me? Why are you reluctant to even talk about what units were involved? Uh, I, I think that the best uh, way to describe this is that this is a journey, not a destination. And as such, uh, I think that uh, to get too much into the details um, could uh, perhaps uh, reveal a little more than, uh, than should be revealed. So we are going to keep our cards close to our vest and continue um, as we have in the past. Yeah. Can you at least say whether or not these were special forces or were part of the regular peacekeeping force? No, I'm not going to go beyond what I've said. Yeah. John. <clears throat> There's been quite a lot of training among different forces of different nationalities inside S4 for these snatch operations. Could you tell us if the troops of any other nationality other than America were involved in this operation? Uh, 
Oh, there were there were troops of other nationalities involved in uh, in the operation, and as I just indicated, there were a number of uh, nations represented on the aircraft that uh, uh, that transported uh, Yelisek to the Hague. It's not uh, I'm not going to get into uh, to any more than I've said on on that score. Yeah, Mark. Can you describe uh, the reaction uh, from the gentleman when he was immediately taken and what his reaction might have been uh, when he was awaiting transfer in Tuzla? Uh, nervousness is the way I understand it. Uh, but beyond that, I don't have much more. This is an individual who uh, previously had boasted that uh, he had a loaded weapon with uh, a number of bullets in it. Uh, the first uh, uh, eight or nine of them were intended for S-4 troops, and the last one was intended for himself. How long did he be living in that apartment? Do you know? uh, I can't tell you that. I just don't happen to know. There may be somebody over in uh, the S-4 area that could provide that Wait, degree of detail. He, is he uh, charged with the killing? Uh, more than 16 uh, are named in the indictment uh, that uh, we have seen. Um, he, uh, and the indictment, by the way, it, since it's an open indictment, uh, you uh, can get copies of it. As I understand it, it's available on the Internet. And it goes into quite a bit of detail uh, by name of individuals he's accused of uh, killing or participating in the murder of. Suzanne. Different subject. Are we finished with that one? Uh, okay. We have one out on this one. Yeah. There was, uh, in the past, you've said here that uh, if you bumped into suspected war criminals, you would then take action. But this doesn't, this mark uh, really a shift in your policy because now you said you had this man under uh, being observed for some time, and now you seem to be stepping up. Your well, I, I didn't indicate how long he had, uh, he had been under observation. All I said was he had been observed and he was detained. And um, I, um, I don't want to give away any timelines or indicate uh, anything on that part of it. But uh, it does not indicate a shift in our uh, approach to things. And, and the primary shift there is that uh, war criminals all along have known that if uh, they are encountered by S-4 troops and the situation is such that they can be detained without undue risk to the S-4 uh, troops, they will be detained. And uh, I think, as the Secretary said, uh, earlier today that this is a clear signal to them that that, uh, that policy is still operational and that uh, they should uh, take action on their own to turn themselves into The Hague. How can you maintain this isn't a shift if this is the first war criminal picked up by U.S. troops? Well, I think you've seen uh, that uh, in the past the U.S. has been a participant in uh, the previous uh, actions where uh, war criminals were detained. If you'd like, I'll go through that uh, list of, uh, of occasions, which goes back to uh, July of 1997, where uh, the British uh, troops detained one indicted war criminal and uh, killed another. Those two were Bosnian Serbs. On the 6th of October, there were 10 uh, Croatian uh, indicted war criminals who turned themselves in, and then, of course, on the 18th of December, uh, December there were uh, Dutch forces uh, involved uh, in taking the lead in the detention of uh, two Bosnian Croats. So um, I see this as a continuation of a policy that has uh, been much in evidence before. The U.S. has participated before, and um, I think that uh, those who are war criminals should, uh, uh, should um, uh, walk in fear. Yes, Suzanne. Uh, has anyone in the building been asked for information uh, from Mr. Starr about the employment of uh, Ms. Lewinsky, particularly Mr. Bacon? Uh, uh, at, uh, at this point, the answer is no. There has been uh, no request for uh, information uh, that we have received. Uh, but uh, clearly, let me go one step further. Uh, this matter is one that uh, the independent counsel has made very clear that uh, uh, that uh, he is going to investigate, and um, and as such, I am uh, I am not able to discuss this issue in any detail at all.
Yep. Brian. Can you, well, I'm sorry, can you say if her computer has been seized or anything like that at all? No, that has not occurred. That has not occurred. Okay. No. Uh, some sources claim that your office may have instructed public affairs staff not to discuss Ms. Lewinsky with reporters. Can you comment on whether such an edict was given? Well, uh, I will say this, uh, that uh, the guidance that we give everybody uh, in connection with any issue, this or any other one, is uh, you should uh, discuss only those things that you know something about. And I think that's very good guidance in this particular case, and that's the guidance we'll continue to follow. Kind of uh, employee she was, or certainly a wide range of stories and rumors and things. You were one of her employers, um, rather than uh, rather than march down this uh, path. I let me just uh, indicate that uh, we'll provide whatever information we can, which is a matter of record uh, uh, through DDI. But uh, I really don't. Uh, I'm not in a position to get into this issue. Defense Investigative Service been asked by the <coughs> FBI or the Independent Council to begin to do some of the to my uh, knowledge, advanced nothing, work to nothing gather like that has happened. phone calls, that sort of thing, <coughs> phone lists or anything like that? No. To my knowledge, nothing like that has happened yet. Was anyone in the Pentagon aware that Tripp was working with Starr? Were her superiors told? I, I'm just not <coughs> going to kind of march down. I'm just not going to march down this road. <laughs> Since uh, Ken Bacon was uh, her immediate supervisor, will he be available to talk uh, for the record since uh, he was her boss? Uh, to the news media, I'll uh, have to await his return here to Washington to get you an answer on that one. We'll try and answer some of uh, the um, uh, information that we may have uh, for the record, but that one I don't know the answer to. For example, Pentagon IG or other sorts of investigations generally about her behavior as, a, as an employee at the Pentagon while at the Pentagon? Uh, there were no investigations. None. Can you tell us anything about Linda Tripp's status? She hasn't been in the she's, building for a couple of days. Well, she's certainly an employee of, uh, of uh, uh, the Pentagon. She remains an employee, and I would anticipate that uh, she would return uh, as soon as she can. What's she is a... Status? Excuse me. What's her status now? Is she on leave? Is she on sick leave? No, she's uh, uh, she is at home. She is participating in um, in the actions that she has responsibility for, and she'll continue to do that. Are there any Pentagon rules about surreptitious uh, recording of conversations by one person or another? Are you just governed by the the state or other federal rules? Uh, I can't answer your question. I will try and get you an answer, but I don't have that. Um, yeah. You said she's participating in actions, uh, in the actions from home. Yeah. Is she on administrative leave or? No, no. She's able to do what she needs to do uh, from there. She's, uh, she is responsible for uh, something called the Joint Civilian Orientation Conference, and uh, uh, we're at the stage of, uh, of that process where she's looking at uh, various nominations, and, uh, and there are other activities that she can do from home and uh, and participate by telephone in in meetings that have uh, require her participation. Yeah. There was a, a newspaper report saying that uh, apparently Ms. Lewinsky had confided in Ms. Tripp that uh, Ms. Lewinsky had had an affair with a senior Pentagon official. <laughs> um, is DOD going to look into that or at least I'm, ask for? I'm just not going to go down that at all. I have nothing for you on any of that. Is it uh, unusual for somebody who supervises no one and has no advanced degrees to have a salary of eighty-eight thousand uh, dollars? What do you mean in the case of? Uh, Linda Tripp. Uh, you're she saying has, that she, she has, has no advanced degrees, and so she. Well, she has a uh, she has a job which is basically a coordinating logistics kind of job, but she seems to have a pretty healthy salary for that kind of responsibilities. Uh, is this uh, uncommon? Uh, I don't have any idea of what the uh, scorecard uh, card is throughout the Pentagon, but I will tell you that the work that she does uh, involves a very high-level coordination and, uh, and a lot of work with uh, organizations outside the building, and uh, 
uh, her, um, her salary level is commensurate with the responsibilities and the activities that she's required to do. Yeah. Was it the same? Did her predecessor have a similar range in salary? Uh, frankly, I can't recall who her predecessor was or what, what the salary range was. Did we have that question taken? We'll see what we can do for you on that. Thank you. Yeah. What was uh, Lewinsky's security clearance level? She had a top secret clearance, uh, which is not unusual for a person who is the uh, administrative assistant to an assistant secretary of defense defense, which uh, her boss was, and uh, she handled uh, um, uh, a variety of uh, material, including classified material. Uh, but I think the point should be made that just because an individual holds a security clearance does not mean that they necessarily uh, have access to the contents of, um, of secure communications. Uh, uh, secure papers. It's simply that you cannot entrust uh, any level of, uh, of uh, secure papers, classified papers, to individuals who do not have the requisite uh, security clearance. Do you know how much she used that on the job? Well, every day. Every day uh, her boss receives classified information. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll take a 15 minute filing break and we'll, we'll have the uh, B minors up here at about 25 after the hour. <laughs> uh, it gives me a uh, pleasure uh, to uh, follow up uh, on Captain Doubleday's uh, notice to you that we we're going to have a second briefing. As he mentioned, these uh, individuals that are going to come up on the podium here will be, uh, have just attended the International Mine Action Center workshop sponsored by DOD's Assistant Secretary of, uh, for Special uh, Operations and Low Intensity Conflict, which was held at Fort Belvoir this week. Uh, the press advisories that are on the back table contain the exact spellings of their names, and what I'll do is I'll introduce them and they'll come up here so that the, the camera can identify just who they are. Uh, the first that I'll introduce is Mr. Ian Bullpit. Manager of Demining, Planning and Operations, the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance. Second, Gerd Bjorsvik, Demining Project Coordinator, Norwegian People's Aid. Lance Malin, the Demining Project Manager, Handicap International. And Lieutenant Colonel Chip Bonus, a member of the Canadian Armed Forces who is Chief Operations and Technical Advisor, Cambodian Mine Action Center. Uh, lastly, uh, Colonel, I got to say this name right, Zahashevsky, uh, who is, I guess, the sponsor of the uh, the conference and is also a uh, a compatriot of Bob Cowles, who most of you who have been following this issue know. I'll, Mr. Uh, Colonel Zakowski has a opening statement, and then please, uh, he'll entertain your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Bridges. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, I I have just a few words as an introductory uh, uh, statement or remarks to, uh, to get on with this uh, short uh, presentation. Uh, we did hold a Mine Action Center workshop um, in Springfield, Virginia uh, on the 20th and 21st uh, of January 1998. Uh, OSD Solik, uh, Ambassador Holmes, sponsored uh, the, uh, the workshop and it was hosted by the Army's uh, Communications Electronics Command Night Vision and Electronic Sensors Directorate. Uh, they are our program manager for humanitarian demining uh, research and development. Now, the workshop focused on identifying and refining the equipment and technology needs of uh, host nation personnel engaged in humanitarian demining throughout the world. Uh, the objective of the MAC workshop uh, was to provide a forum for the National Mine Action Centers and the non-governmental -govern organizations that are actually involved in demining to identify and prioritize their most pressing equipment needs. Uh, these requirements uh, that they uh, presented to us the last two days will serve to guide uh, future U.S. Department of Defense uh, demining technology development efforts under our, our humanitarian demining R&D program. Additionally, the workshop provided a forum for the NVSD, uh, the Fort Belvoir people, uh, the equipment developers there, to uh, gain a better appreciation 
and understanding of operational and environmental conditions confronting deminers. In addition to uh, DOD technology developers, a workshop included representatives from demining organizations operating in Afghanistan, Angola, Bosnia, Cambodia, and Mozambique. And as Colonel Bridges in, uh, introduced the, uh, the following individuals, uh, they'll be talking to you or available to answer questions pertaining to their particular uh, organization's roles and activities in uh, four of those countries that I mentioned, Afghanistan, Angola, Bosnia, and Cambodia. Uh, we're going to follow this workshop up in the future with similar workshops and, and uh, opportunities to, uh, to not only engage the international community in uh, discussions about technology and equipment needs, but also to share what we have done in our substantial demining uh, R&D program with the international community. And having said that, uh, I'll turn it over for uh, your questions to uh, these four gentlemen behind me. Thank you. I, something you said, is this just to, this first conference, is this just to prioritize U.S. R&D needs, or is there, was there also recommendations for prioritizing the R&D needs of other nations? No, what, uh, again, the focus, uh, well, just to give you a little background, in 1995 is when we initiated our R&D program, and it was, a, it was a quick ramp up. So we did what we could initially to get some equipment in the hands of D miners. Uh, we've recognized now that, uh, that we're in this for the long haul. Uh, the long term, if you will, and so we're taking a, a longer or a more systematic approach in how we do the research and development program. And one of the key elements, obviously, is to identify exactly what it is that the user, the, the D miner, needs out in the field. Uh, what we did in the past is we used the best experience, expertise that we had available from our special forces personnel who do the training, uh, the expertise that we had from our technology developers in the countermine business, the explosive ordnance disposal business, the uh, the other communities that, that are involved. So we use that expertise and, and we've got a uh, start on the program. We've got some equipment out in the field that, uh, that is being used, is being evaluated in, in various operational theaters. But now we're trying to look down the road and, uh, and address more specific needs of D miners. So I hope that answered your question. Still, I mean, for, for um, D mining operations also. Were, were any of the other countries that participated, did they discuss what their specific needs were? Or is the result of this workshop only what the U.S. needs are? I'm okay, maybe, uh, maybe I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't uh, probably st state the focus or the mission. Uh, it wasn't to address what our needs are. It was to solicit the needs of the, uh, the host nation deminers. Including U.S. trainers. We've done that already. We, we know what the trainers need. Again, that, that's basically what, uh, what we did or we used to start up our R&D program. So now we're, we're anxious to find out what the folks on the ground in Afghanistan or Cambodia, uh, what equipment they need that we may not have already addressed in our R&D program. And then we'd get a readout from you guys as to what the answer to that is. As yes. a result of this workshop, what did all four countries say they needed? We uh, will prepare the, uh, the minutes or the after action report uh, probably in a week, 10 days, and that will be available to uh, other, uh, other nations that have similar R&D programs or it'll be available for my office upon request. Give us just a couple of examples sure. of what came out of the conference. Uh, one of the, uh, country specific again. Uh, Everybody, just give me 20. I'm sorry, but could you give me 20 seconds on what your individual needs are? Sure. Is that feasible to ask? Um, We're Ian, starting with Afghanistan. Okay, right? Ian Bulpit from the uh, the Afghanistan program. I guess from our perspective, and I think that was mirrored um, by a number of other uh, programs as well, there are some fairly simple innovations that, uh, that we could certainly use to assist either demining operations or to provide better protection for our deminers. Simple things, for example, um, um, mechanisms to cut or reduce the, the vegetation problems that we, that we all face. Uh, it's extremely difficult to clear mines from the ground if you're uh, trying to progress through eight feet of grass. Um, simple and cheap um, protective clothing is another good example of the, the types of things that we're after. Uh, in the longer term, obviously, pending a quantum leap in, in terms of technology, we're all after better ways to identify where the hot spots are on the ground, where the mines are themselves and so forth. Uh, but most of the stuff that we are after as a program is actually quite simple. And I think that's basically the thrust of um, the workshop that we attended, was to identify principally some of those simple things that the uh, U.S. can assist with and hopefully also provide some focus in the longer term as well. Did anybody 
um, discuss some of the technology trade-offs with some of the research areas like ground penetrating rad radar or magnetometer detection? Uh, not the specifics of any of those those systems. I think um, I, I'm not totally aware of the, the progress on, on any of those particular issues. Uh, I think most of them are still at sort of drawing board stage, uh, or at least in, in primary production uh, stage. <coughs> Uh, but certainly that's the sort of technology we're looking at in the longer term. And I, I guess we have to pursue that if we're going to be um, really address the long-term problem of uh, landmines. <coughs> Any other examples of things that were priorities for other countries? From Lance Malin from Handicap International, which is a, a French charity demining in Bosnia. Uh, my main concern as a deminer myself is that we need accidents do happen in the minefields and we need to protect our deminers in a better way than we're protecting them now to avoid the very disfiguring and uh, very debilitating injuries that they receive so that for me was one of my main priorities uh, Geir Björsik from the Norwegian people said uh, <clears throat> there's another thing as well and that is you could say that the mine issue the mine problem is kind of two-parted one thing is that we need technology to find single mines, as you were just referring to, the, for instance, the uh, geo-radar, the radar penetrating things, which I have heard for the time being, even at this distance from the soil, they are not as per today able to give a very good picture of the ground. And they're also doing research from the same things on planes. So we are probably talking about a few years into the future. But one thing is to find a single mine. But the other issue, which for me in Angola, will will be actually more important is to find some tools that can explain for us where there aren't mines because when we have spent months maybe a year clearing a not too big area let's say one times one kilometer with manual d miners working with the detectors and produce in vegetation 10 feet high with a trip wire uh, attached to mines in here snakes and everything it takes a very long time so after having cleared that area, it normally turns out that only 10 to 20 percent of that big area was actually mined. But you still have to clear the whole area, of course, because it's suspected mined and people won't use it. So if we could get some kind of tool that tells us whether there aren't mines, a green light or whatever, uh, that would be a tremendous asset. And I would also like to just add that this workshop like this has been very valuable for us because until now, we. There hasn't been too much effort on asking from the sci scientist side and from the donor side, really asking the field users what they need. What do you need? What are your obstacles in the field? A lot of the equipment we see coming up are based on training on like football parts. And uh, I mean, Africa isn't like that. Our realities are very different from a normal training site back in Europe. So uh, actually coming together with field personnel, with donors, with uh, scientists, and military uh, expertise, it's a very good combination and we all have a tremendous good feeling after this uh, workshop. From the uh, perspective of the Cambodian Mine Action Center, the uh, requirement to find individual mines is probably the single item that would come closest to being a silver bullet that you could use to um, take care of the mine problem. That would enable someone to go directly to that mine and destroy it or remove it as the case might uh, require. Um, my colleague here from uh, Angola mentioned that uh, the difficulty now is clearing a lot of area and that's what consumes the time and the money and the effort. So uh, this uh, capacity to be able to de detect an individual mine from a distance so that you remove the safety uh, problem uh, is really the key to uh, solving this. Uh, besides that, uh, mechanical demining is still a, uh, for humanitarian purposes, is still a very, very young uh, science. And uh, the attempts to date to use military technology have not been very successful. Uh, the military technology has a risk acceptance factor that uh, is applied under the conditions of, uh, of the battlefield. And you can, you can accept that uh, some casualties might result from a lack of clearing all the mines. But that's not really acceptable for humanitarian purposes. So the direct application has not been, uh, not been uh, uh, sufficient. Um, I just I might add another point. Uh, this conference was uh, very good from the 
perspective of not only being able to discuss technical issues, but to surface, uh, surface the fact that the technical solutions have to operate in the real world in terms of the socioeconomic effects that they will impinge upon, in terms of uh, the benefits, if those type of uh, factors are considered, of giving employment to local people where that's possible. And there are some of the uh, pieces of equipment that uh, amputees, for example, could uh, be employed on uh, fabricating. Gentlemen, I'm Simon Scott's boy from CNN. Uh, one question about where you think you go from here. Uh, I mean, conversations, it's always interesting when you get engineers and designers together with people who use equipment in the field. Uh, that's that's always interesting. Did you get any sense of feedback from the uh, from the people you were working with here uh, in terms of ideas they're working on or ideas they might have gotten from you in the course of your discussions on where things might go in the future, co concrete developments uh, uh, or, or or ideas for developments? Uh, I, I think uh, that that's true. We we did, but. Um, this is not a simple uh, situation. There are lots of factors at play in, in designing this equipment. Uh, a great deal of it can take uh, benefit from the military work that's been done in the past. And that's not always available for all the usual reasons, uh, including uh, proprietary information at the lower end of the scale and uh, security from uh, at the higher end. But uh, we were able to discuss, uh, discuss that uh, that factor, and uh, when you get a group of people together, such as was assembled by uh, Colonel Zachevsky for this meeting, uh, you uh, have a considerable amount of talent uh, that has been exposed to a lot of technology. So yes, we were able to discuss that. Um, in terms of, of humanitarian demining, the requirements themselves, in and of themselves, are not very complicated. Uh, detection, uh, speeding up the process, protecting someone, and uh, maybe in the, in, under the uh, heading of speeding up the process, giving the manual deminers a little bit of equipment that would work a little bit better. But overcoming some of the challenges is a huge problem, and that's where the value of this, uh, this meeting comes in, because the engineers get exposed to the uh, greater range of the uh, factors that impinge on that. Uh, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I, I, I will say that uh, there's always an exchange of information and ideas here that let all of us go back to uh, where we're, the particular country we're working in and take those ideas back for use. Uh, let me give you an example, uh, a simple thing like a prodder uh, used to locate the mines underground by the deminers. Um, one of the NGOs in Cambodia came up with a prodder with a slightly different design using uh, essentially instead of a sharp point on it, a, uh, a wood uh, chisel point and then had the Cambodians manufactured out of old car springs. Uh, it's ideas like that that get very practical, that they're, they're engineering ideas, but if you don't meet with these people in fora like this, they don't get exchanged very well at all. One more point, uh, there is an attempt being made on the, uh, let's call it the technical side, to exchange information worldwide on the uh, internet using the email, and it already exists. and. Uh, Colonel Sajewski's uh, people will, are already on that, uh, that email net, uh, University of Western Australia, Warwick University, and some of the demining centers, including uh, CMAC in Cambodia. And that is embryonic. Uh, James Madison University here in Harrisonburg is on that as well. And uh, the intent is that any and all technical information uh, exchange will be enabled, and it will be kept uh, exclusive uh, in terms of the participants so that we don't get a lot, any time wasted, if you will, with uh, uninformed discussion on there. And it will be open to uh, mining centers, uh, certainly any research uh, engineering uh, type people and uh, any companies, for example, that wanted to uh, become involved. If I can just ask one more question. I mean, obviously, if you get more money, you can train more people and you can put more uh, more mine clearing operations into the field. Uh, but do you see a point at which, or have you already reached the point at which where you see that the, uh, the real source of progress has got to be some sort of a technological leap in how things are, uh, how things are done? Um, I think there was a natural 
desire to see technology as a solution because it's been a solution in so many places and so many other fields. And uh, as we were discussing uh, just before the uh, just before we began here, the uh, startup on this for a lot of the technical staffs was o literally overnight. And the the rush to apply the military technology, for example, was the was the was the reaction, the only reaction possible. But um, developing from here is going to take uh, the, the same amount of effort and the same amount of time as it took to uh, to do uh, that sort of development at, at the outset. It's not. It's not. There have been no breakthroughs at this point. There have been incremental improvements. Incre incremental improvements in. Uh, ground mine detecting, for instance, but nobody has come up at this point with anything that is uh, viewed by any of the organizations involved as a major step forward. Can we, Grant Willis from Army Times, can we hear a bit more about the U.S. Army's involvement in this uh, effort and uh, especially particularly what's going on in the uh, night vision lab? Uh, I understand there's some umbrella effort that's given money or assistance to universities and companies uh, that are working on these incremental improvements and that in particular there's some kind of signal analysis technology that could very uh, easily be apparently uh, inserted into existing mine detection devices that would actually identify a type of mine or at least better distinguish, cut down maybe fivefold the number of uh, false alarms that a person would get which would speed things up a lot. There are, <clears throat> there are several efforts ongoing within the Department of Defense and also outside the Department uh, of Defense. Uh, those efforts are very basic science, basic research. Uh, we're aware of them. We share that information. Uh, the program that Solik is responsible for is intended to you know, rapidly prototype a technology to get it out in the hands of the user uh, so that, number one, they can do something with it, i.e., remove the landmines, and, number two, get the user's input as to modifying that equipment or refining that equipment. Um, the technologies that, uh, that we spoke of, ground penetrating radar, for example, or the technologies that you're referring to at these universities, those are very basic scientific efforts. Uh, the term embryonic was used. I'm not sure if, if that's applicable across the board, but most of those scientific efforts are, are, have not yet reached the, reached the stage where we can put a piece of hardware, whatever it's configured to look like, but uh, it's not, the, the technology is not ready for us yet to put that hardware out in the field and get, uh, and get some useful results from it. Uh, but again, I think the point that needs to be made is uh, the folks at Fort Belvoir uh, are very well situated because they're co-located with not only the, uh, the Army's countermine efforts, uh, and as you probably know, the Army is responsible for the Marine Corps countermine uh, R&D efforts. So they're co-located, they, they share information. Uh, in fact, uh, things that don't work in our demining program uh, the, the countermine folks look at to see if it has military application and vice versa. Uh, so there is a, a, good, uh, a good sharing of information. There's also a, a new agency or new office, rather, that stood up on the 1st of October uh, as a result of uh, a significant amount of work here in the Pentagon over the last year called the Joint UXO Coordination Office. And that, uh, that office is uh, responsible for coordinating uh, technology uh, efforts uh, and requirements in not only humanitarian demining, but also military countermine, uh, explosive ordnance disposal efforts, active range clearance, and environmental security. So there's another activity there that, uh, that we use uh, and we'll probably use a lot more in the future once they get uh, fully operational to share information and, and make sure that information is passed so that our program, the SOLIC program, can pick the right time to leverage that technology into a, a prototype that we can put out in the in Afghanistan or in, uh, in Angola or wherever we've got forces that are operating. Did you say UXO? UXO, uh, which uh, is the acronym that's used in, quote, unquote, the business for unexploded ordnance. What's your best option, though, right now for rapid prototyping? If the rest of these things are embryonic, what's, what's the best idea out there for rapid fielding? I'm not sure if, uh, what you mean by best option. I mean, what we do is, uh, is we take, for example, we'll, we'll take these uh, requirements that we received uh, we'll put a, uh, a proposal out to industry, uh, telling industry uh, what the requirement is, and then what we'll see what industry responds with. Uh, the, the folks at Fort Belvoir will evaluate those proposals, and then we'll, uh, we'll issue uh, contracts and evaluate those uh, potential technologies to see if we, 
if there is a, uh, a potential to, uh, to rapidly prototype that particular technology. Okay, so, I mean, is there an operational requirement you're going to develop? And is this strictly, is this for mine, single mine detection you're talking about? No, we, we look at not only single mine detection, we're, we're also obviously interested in wide area detection. Uh, but that technology is uh, is very what infant. Are you, what are you putting a proposal out to industry for? We're not putting it out yet, but when we do put it out, it will be to cover air, the area of uh, minefield or mined area detection, right. single mine detection or location, mine neutralization, and also we're interested in technologies or equipment that we can adapt or use to teach people either how to demine or uh, how, uh, mine awareness training. So we look at four basic areas, not just detection. And so what is going to put this out? No, the night vision personnel, uh, the, our program manager, will put that uh, proposal out towards the end of the year. That's what I was going to ask you. You think it'll be the end of the year? Yes, mm -hmm. because we're still working on a uh, broad agency announcement uh, that uh, was responded to back in November of 96, and that was a two-year BAA, and we're still working off of uh, uh, potential candidates on that list. in any way connected with uh, the administration's 2010 initiative? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we're, our efforts uh, are coordinated with Ambassador Inderford at State. Um, he, he is very interested in technology. Obviously, technology is part of the solution to, to uh, humanitarian demining. So our efforts are coordinated with him. Our efforts have his support. And, uh, and we hope to, uh, to reinforce or support uh, the demining 2010 initiative with the results of this workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. Just a, just a point of clarification. I noticed that the word embryonic came up, and, and I think you were keying on my use of it. I, I was referring strictly to the uh, development of the email uh, information sharing network, which is embryonic. I wasn't referring to any specific technology or even to the whole process that uh, we're trying to go through right now. I, I think that's, that's uh, quite a, a difference to, to uh, highlight.